message is finishing what he started. Jesus began his ministry uh, in this book. Jesus begins his ministry with baptism as the anointed king of Israel. And he also takes the mantle of prophet. And now coming into Luke chapter 21, Jesus is going to finish what he started. And uh, Jesus, in this passage today, he is going to scare them witless. He, he's going to shock them. They have never seen Jesus like this. Yes, Jesus has prophesied before, no doubt about it. I mean, Jesus has told them about the future. Matthew chapter 10 records this prophecy that Jesus gave them about being persecuted. And in that particular prophecy, Jesus folds, he does what every prophet does. He takes the very near future and the very far future and he folds these two things in on each other. And, and, and then we as the interpreters and the readers have to pull them apart to see it. That's what he's gonna do today in this passage in Luke 21. But Jesus takes on the mantle of their prophet, but now he's an apocalyptic prophet, which means he's not just predicting stuff in the future. He's not just telling you, hey, this is how things are gonna turn out for you. You're gonna be dragged before kings and princes and governors and things like that. He's an apocalypticist which means that he just has some pretty scary imagery that's coming down and, and it's going to blow his disciples' hair back. I mean, they're just going to be left shocked by this. In the last days before Jesus dies brutally on a cross, Jesus alternates between these two offices as king and prophet. In fact, when Jesus gives them this prophecy about the end of the world, which you and I are going to learn about today, when Jesus gives them this prophecy, it's really about him. It's about his coming his coming in judgment, and his coming in salvation for the elect. And so what Jesus is going to do is he's going to take two events. One is the very near future of the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem in AD 70. And then he's going to look down the corridor of history and take this final event when he comes at the very end of the age, and he's going to fold these two things in on themselves, and you and I are going to pull them apart today. That's what we're going to do. Uh, so Let's give a little backstory first. In the, first, in the last week of Jesus' life, he has begun this time arriving as the heir of David, the true king of Israel. He triumphantly comes into the city, and then at the end of this passage, he shifts into a weeping prophet. He becomes like Jeremiah. Remember the book of Lamentations? That book is called Lamentations because Jeremiah is wailing over the city. And Jesus is being exalted, celebrated, palm branches. It looks like the Feast of Tabernacles. I mean, they are just waving palm branches, and it's beautiful, it's amazing. And there's such a raucous celebration. And he gets right to the end of the corridor there, and he looks at Jerusalem, and then he cries aloud and stops the parade and stops the celebration. Yerushalayim, Yerushalayim, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. You who kill the prophets and stone those spokesmen from God who are sent to you. How I have longed to gather you in like a hen gathers her brood. How I have longed to gather you into my, my bosom like a mother her children. But you were unwilling. And so today you reject your king. You reject his coming. You reject this procession. And Jesus wails like Jeremiah, lamenting over the city. And so tears are streaming down his eyes, and this is very shocking to his disciples. And he says, look, your house, he's referring to the temple, your house is left to you desolate, and you will not see me again until you cry out, Baruch haba b'ashem Adonai. Blessed is he, the king, who comes in the name of the Lord. And then Jesus turns his sights on cleansing the temple. So then what he does is he prophetically, as a prophet, he goes into the temple complex. And then he goes into the court of the Gentiles, this hall of the Gentiles. And you know what that's supposed to be? That's supposed to be the one place in the temple complex, the campus, where the Gentiles, those who are not a people, can come and draw near to Israel's God. And the Gentiles are there for sure. There are a lot of God-fearers there. They've come down from cities like Antioch and others. But they can't press in. Why? Because the hall, the Gentile hall, is filled with Jewish kiosks. Selling, and these guys are crooks. They are price gouging the foreigners who are coming in to celebrate their feast. So these crooks are price gouging them. Jesus sees this racket going on, and it's cluttered, and then the Gentiles can't come in and draw close to Israel's God. And so Jesus fashions a whip and he begins to beat the animals and flip over the tables and cries out prophetically like a prophet in the temple. It is written, this is supposed to be a house of prayer for the nations. 
so that the nations can come in here and pray and draw near to Israel's God, but you have made it a den of robbers. And so Jesus cleanses the temple. Now, this is fast-tracking him to judgment. It's fast-tracking him to the Sanhedrin. And then he does something else. He goes on offense. So what happens is, is that one by one, the religious leaders, the religious elites step up to test him. Can you imagine this? Like some of you, I saw some of you in line, like checking your kids in. Can you imagine a line like that of Sadducees and Pharisees and scribes? These esteemed masters, some of them members of the high court of Israel, the Sanhedrin, and they have lined up to take their turn at Jesus. Because what do they want to do? They want to show what a fraud he is. I mean, these are guys who are graduates of the esteemed Jerusalem Academy. It's like Harvard. And they want to step up and challenge and put a riddle to this rabbi from the community college in Capernaum. And they want to show that he's, he doesn't know what you think he knows. He doesn't have the wisdom that you think he has. And one by one, the New Testament says, they step up. And one by one, he knocks them down. And when you do this in public, you, you publicly shame an authority figure. That is a stigma that sticks with them. So there's a point at which in the text, especially if you uh, cross-reference Matthew's gospel, there's a point at which in the text where they stop coming to Jesus, it says no one dared challenge him anymore because they stepped up to the Messiah, the God who has become king. And he knocks them down with his superior, supreme wisdom. And they are embarrassed. They are publicly shamed. And in an honor-shame culture, this is one of the worst things that can happen to you in public, is for you to be publicly shamed. It sticks. It sticks. So now Jesus goes on offense. He asks them an unsolvable riddle. None of them know the answer. How in the world can it be that the son of David is called Lord by David? They were like, I, uh, we don't know. He's like, yeah, you don't know. And so in all these events, it's as if a dam in Jesus' heart has broken. And the cracks have always been there, seeping, leaking. But now this week, this last week, Jesus is going to unleash on them everything that he's wanted to say since he was 12 years old. Since he sat in the, in the schools of the masters when he was 12, Luke 21. Will you look down at verse 37 with me? Because this is really kind of an explanation of the scene. Here's what it looked like this last week. Here's what he was doing. It says, every day he was teaching in the temple, but at night he went out and lodged on the mount called Olivet. And early in the morning, all the people came to him in the temple to hear him. So he is, you have to understand, the temple is surrounded by this, this portico, what's called Solomon's Colonnade. And the Colonnade of Solomon is where these, these esteemed masters would meet and their students, their Talmudim, which is the word for disciples in Hebrew. Their disciples would gather around them and listen to these esteemed masters pontificate about the Torah and sing it. And now all of their students have left them and they're all around Rabbi Jesus, Master Jesus, listening to him. And so this just is an impossible, intractable dilemma for the rabbis. So filling in the picture a bit from Matthew, we know. So here's what Jesus was doing. What Jesus was doing was going very early, teaching in the temple all day. And then in the evening at dusk, he would hike back up about 100 feet up, to, up the Mount of Olives to lodge there. And from the Mount of Olives, you could really look down and see the city. And so that is really what's going on. And one day, as they were leaving the temple, Jesus denounces the temple. He denounces the religious leaders. Matthew 23 is a full account of this. Jesus basically pronounces a prophetic woe. He uses the word oi over the religious leaders. Woe to you. This is God's judgment language. And so headed back up the hill... The disciples try to draw Jesus' attention to how beautiful the city is. And the city is wonderful. The temple and surrounding edifice were considered one of the jewels of the ancient Roman world. Uh, Herod, the Herod family, the Herodian family, had started a project 46 years earlier of renovating the entire city. So it's not just the temple. It isn't just the temple. It's all the wealthy homes surrounding the temple. It's the priestly quarters. It's the uh, the the uh, citadel of Antonia. 
It is the homes, the synagogue. There's also a a, a sports stadium there. There's a theater, a Roman style theater. It is a beautiful, gorgeous city. It's whitewashed and gilded. Here's the way ancient historian, first century historian Josephus describes it. I'll put up on the screen for you. It says, the exterior of the building wanted for nothing that could not astound either mind or eye. For being covered on all sides with massive plates of gold, the sun was no sooner up than it radiated so fiery a flash that persons straining to look at it were compelled to avert their eyes as from the sun's rays. To approaching strangers, it appeared from a distance like a snow-clad mountain. For all that was not overlaid with gold was of purest, whitest stone. From its summit protruded sharp golden spikes to prevent birds from settling upon and polluting the roof. And some of the stones of the building were so massive the size of a Roman barge. And that is true if you go down into the basement of what is thought to be today the Temple Mount. If you go down into a cave there, there are stones that are as long as a bus. When the Romans got down there and saw that, they just thought, well, we're not moving that. <laughs> so just a beautiful, gorgeous city radiating, gleaming in the, in the Middle Eastern sun. The city was opulent and desirable. In fact, it was so much so that when Titus in AD 70 came down to destroy it, he tried with all of his might to avert its destruction. He tried to negotiate several times with the Jewish revolutionaries that were held up in the city, but they would not have it. So he had to destroy the temple and he had to destroy the city. So let's unpack this passage that Jesus gives us. Look in verses five through nine. It says, while some were speaking of the temple. So they're just, we know from Matthew chapter 24, this parallel passage that the disciples are just going on and on about how beautiful the temple and the surrounding buildings are. It says, how it was adorned with noble stones and offerings. He said, as for these things you see, um, the days will come when there will not be one, uh, be left one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. And they asked him, teacher, what will these things be? And what, be, what will be the sign when these things are about to take place? And he said, see that you are not led astray, for many will come in my name saying, I am he. And the time is at hand. Do not go after them. And we, when you hear of wars and tumults or rumors of wars, do not be terrified, for these things must first take place, but then the end will not be all at once. So on his way back up the Mount of Olives, it is dusk, and now these white gleaming buildings have turned orange in the setting sun. And the disciples stop about halfway up, and they look out over the city, and they, they're gawking. Look how beautiful God's city is, the city of David. And, and then Jesus can see the city, but then he can see down through the quarter of time about 37 years later when this city is on fire when it is in flames, when the stench of death is all you can smell, is what fills your nostrils. And he can see it. And he begins prophesying to them. And so they want to know the answer to two questions. When will that happen? Wouldn't you ask that? I know I would. And then what will be the signs leading up to the end of the age? So there are really two questions going on here. One is, when will the destruction of the temple take place? We know historically it took place in AD 70. And then what what will be the signs leading up to the coming, your coming at the end of the age? So the beginning of that age, that final age, began with the coming of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost and the destruction of the temple later, officially. And it will end with the coming of Christ in glory. So number one, Jesus tells them about increasing false messiahs. He says, don't be led astray. Well, false messiahs are coming. Between now and that time, you can bank on it. You can bet on this. There are going to be people who come and say, I'm the Messiah, or I have a new revelation of the Messiah. And Jesus says, don't you believe it for one second. So in his day, these were men like Honey the Circle Drawer, a so-called miraculous uh, Messiah who was a false claimant on Jesus' kingdom, or a Thranges, a Jewish shepherd turned rebel who was hailed to be the next Jewish king, or Shimon Magus, a Samaritan, who claimed to be a miracle-working Messiah and the reincarnation of Jesus himself, or Dasithios, the Samaritan, again, claiming to be the Christ and comparable, comparable to rebels like Judas of Galilee and Theudas, or John of Geshala, 
the zealots there in AD 70 who opposed Titus, or Titus himself. When General Titus came down, Josephus' account is this, is that he tried to convince the Jews, Titus is your Christ. He's your Messiah. He's your anointed king. And then he gave the Jews false signs. Things like when Titus walked by the pool of Siloam, which had dried up at that time, it filled back up with water when he walked by it. So he gave them all these freaky, weird, false signs. And Jesus prophesied this very thing. There will be false messiahs who claim my birthright. They will claim to be Christ, but they're not. Don't you believe it for one second because that's not how I'm coming back. And so today, our application of that would be anyone who denies that Christ has come in bodily form. Anyone who denies that God has been incarnated as king in the person of Christ, that's a false Christ. Anyone denying Jesus' death on a cross and his bodily resurrection from the dead, false Jesus. Those who would deny the uniqueness of Christ as God's one and only son, false Jesus. Anyone claiming to finish the revelation of God that God has once and for all revealed in the person of Christ. The writer of Hebrews puts it this way. In the past, God spoke through prophets and through various kinds of revelations. But today, in finality, he has spoken in the person of Jesus of Nazareth, the Christ, the one revealed Messiah. Anyone claiming to be the reincarnation of Jesus. How many times do you turn on the news and have some weird dude claiming to be a reincarnation of Jesus? Remember the Hail Bob comment? Remember that? People got worked up. Comet was coming by. Signs in the heavens. And they all died. That's a shame. Because that was a false Christ. So they're bound to come. And this will characterize this age, this entire age, leading up to the destruction of the temple and leading up to the coming of Christ. False Christs will arise. And you ought to anticipate that, Jesus says. That's kind of the normative thing. Number two, rising global turmoil. He says this, false Christs will come, don't believe them, but there will be rising global turmoil. Don't be alarmed. So don't be alarmed. Jesus tells them that they will hear of wars and tumults or rumors of wars. Let's read the rest here. He says, then he said to them, nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom and there will be great earthquakes and in various places, famines and pestilences and there will be terrors and great signs in heaven. But before all this, they will lay their hands on you and persecute you. So what is Jesus saying here? So Jesus is just blowing them away. They have never heard Jesus talk like this. At the end of his life now, his earthly ministry, he is really shaking them to their core. And so Jesus, the Jews in his time had a choice of messianic visions, which one they would follow. So they could choose to follow the dominant one in Jesus' day, which was the messianic vision of the revolutionary. The political revolutionary who comes, like some of the guys I just read to you, or cited to you, he comes and he overthrows a political government. Yeah, but then what? Then what do you get? You might have one good kingdom. You might have your independence for a while, but eventually somebody is going to ruin it. Eventually somebody is going to spoil that because eventually someone through corruption is going to be unfaithful to the Torah. So how do you get the fulfillment of these promises in the Old Testament of an everlasting kingdom that Daniel prophesies in Daniel 9 and Daniel chapter 11? How do you get that? Uh, How do you get this God who becomes the shepherd king through his servant David forever in Ezekiel 34. How do you get that? Well, you can't get it through an earthly political revolutionary. And that is the vision of Messiah that the Jews in Jesus' day chose. And they rejected his vision of Messiah, which was a king who comes and becomes the king of hearts. The king who comes and dies on a cross and becomes the Passover lamb for your sins and brings you in an everlasting, eternal, unending relationship back with the Lord your God, that king, that vision of kingdom they rejected. And Jesus warned them on many occasions, if you choose the revolutionary's vision of the Messiah, let me tell you where you're going to end up. We're going to find out today. So they had a choice to make. They could choose the son born, Emmanuel, God with us, the king, the one who has the title, who bears the title on his shoulders, almighty God, prince of peace, everlasting father, the God who is in our midst. And they rejected him. They chose wrong. 
They chose to feed the streams of national rebellion and to silence God's last prophet to the nation. And this rejection of their king sets them on a path and leads them inexorably to war with Rome. This is precisely what Jesus is warning here. If you, choose, you have chosen that path, and here's what is now prophetically going to happen in your near future. Rome is coming to your land, and they're going to destroy you, every brick, every stone, and every person. And so then he talks about, in verse 11, cosmic upheaval. He says, there will be great earthquakes and in various places, famines and pestilences. In addition to the nations constantly rumoring war, so war was just atmospheric. It was in the air. You, everyone was talking about the upcoming war with Rome. So these revolutionaries were just, they had a fire in their bones, they couldn't quit. And in addition to this, you have all this cosmic upheaval. It just feels like the world below your feet is about to come apart at the seams. Jesus says that's how it's gonna feel. In their day, they had some massive, massive, just a maelstrom, a turmoil that overtook the city. Things like the explosion of Mount Vesuvius, which killed tens of thousands, one of the worst disasters in Rome's history. That happened after this prophecy. All kinds of other earthquakes, like the earthquake in Laodicea, which killed a million, almost a million people, just bam, dead from an earthquake. So Jesus prophesies these things and he tells them this, when you see all of that unfold, don't be alarmed. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Yeah, because why, why? Why shouldn't I be alarmed? And you and I shouldn't be alarmed either. I am tempted to be alarmed every single time I turn on the news today. Because every time I turn on the news, our president is threatening war with North Korea, like a world-ending nuclear war. And I go, huh? And then you know what Jesus says to me? He says, don't be alarmed. Don't be alarmed. Your president is not running the world. Do you think those folks over in Asia are running the world? No, there's one king who's sitting on the throne. That's Jesus. And the world will end when he says it will end at a timing that he says and in a way he says it will. So don't be alarmed. These are the kinds of things that go on before Jesus comes back. Don't be alarmed. When you hear of the globe just melting down in global warming, our ice caps are melting, we're all gonna be flooded, and we're all gonna live in Nebraska. <laughs> right? Yeah, no, we're not, the rest of us are not saying yay. He says, you're all gonna have to move to Nebraska. That's not what he's saying. Look, he's saying these kinds of things just... The, this is what characterizes this age. And until the temple is destroyed, and from then until Jesus returns and ends this age, these are the kinds of things you should expect. Don't freak out. Don't freak out. That's what he's saying. Trust in the Lord. And you and I are to trust in the Lord as the sovereign king. Number three, he tells them about escalating persecution. So you better persevere to the end verse 13, he says, this will be, he said, verse 12, he says, but before all this, they will lay their hands on you and persecute you, delivering you up to the synagogues and prisons. And you will be brought before kings and governors for my name's sake. If you read the book of Acts, this is exactly what happens. Exactly what happens is Jesus prophesied it. And then he says, this will be your opportunity to bear my witness. So you've got an opportunity here. Yay. Settle it, therefore, in your minds not to meditate beforehand how you will answer, for I will give you a mouth of wisdom, which none of your adversaries will be able to withstand or contradict. Now, you will be delivered up even by parents and brothers. Imagine that. Family divisions and relatives and friends, and some of you will even be put to death. You will be hated by all for your name's sake, but not a hair of your head will perish by your endurance, you will gain your lives. What is he saying here? He says, if you endure to the end, here's the deal. They may be able to kill your body, but they can't kill your soul. Not a hair of your head and your resurrected body will be singed or cut or broken. You have everlasting life. And so he tells them, persevere to the end. You see, they rejected their king, the nation's one true prophetic voice, God's voice. And he says, they'll reject you. That characterizes this age. I get really upset, and I really got upset when I first came to the Lord, and I would tell people about Jesus. And I would get angry at them because they wouldn't get saved right there. I'd be like, what's wrong with you? I just told you the gospel. You should just be coming in with palm branches. You know, you should be celebrating the arrival of your king. And they're like, get out of here. You're stupid. 
You know, and, and here's the deal. That is what is going to characterize this age. When they hate you, it's because they first, John 15, it's because they first hated your Lord and your master, the one you follow. If they hated me, they're going to hate you. So this is just the norm. You should just anticipate and expect that the world is going to revile your very existence. I heard an interview with an atheist not too long ago, and he was talking about, or she was talking about uh, how her and her friends talk about evangelical Christians. And it was really eye-opening because they just sit around and make jokes about us, just laughing that we're so stupid and so gullible to believe in Jesus the master. Jesus says, yeah, that's the way it's going to be. You're going to be persecuted, and even the closest relationships you have, you'll, you'll be shut out. You'll be exiled from family as well. But don't worry, Jesus says. Don't, don't worry about that. Persevere to the end. The gospel has a legal right to exist in the world, and the book of Acts shows that in the Roman world, the gospel had a legal right to exist. So every single trial that you see punctuated in the book of Acts Christianity wins the trial, which shows that the gospel has the legal right to, to exist in this world. And so you and I are to make a rational defense of the gospel, but look at some of the situations they got pulled into, things they could not have predicted. I mean, things they could not have really prepared for. You and I prepare, we're prepared to defend our faith, but Jesus says here, there are going to be some situations in which you're going to be pulled into that you, you couldn't have possibly be prepared for. And at that time, you just trust and rely in the Holy Spirit. And this is to the disciples. You trust and you rely in the Holy Spirit who will give you superior wisdom. And you won't even know really where that, th where that thought or that idea came from. Has that ever happened to you? I got pulled into a conversation downtown Seattle in Pioneer Square one time. And uh, I was a Bible student at the time. I think I was taking like Christian doctrine and New Testament Greek one the first year. And so I was learning in pastor school some, some good stuff, some deep stuff, and it was fun. But I heard this conversation. This guy had engaged a friend of mine, and he had done some homework. He had gone to the library. This was like before the days of the internet where you actually had to go to a physical library and get a book off the shelf, and uh, you couldn't just Google it. But he had done some research, and he, here's what he was prepared to do. He was prepared to argue with me and my friend that the church down through history has done a lot of bad and it's really been corrupt. And I mean to tell you, I got pulled into the conversation. I had done no study on that subject whatsoever. I was studying like New Testament Greek, man. I wasn't studying this at all. And somehow my friend and I, we, God just gave us this incredible supernatural wisdom to answer him. And we, we tore him up. I mean, uh, so we were able to answer it. And so in some small ways, you and I experienced this where the Holy Spirit says, you know, there are times when you're going to be persecuted and you're going to be pressed and the Holy Spirit will give you wisdom to answer this. So Jesus says, in light of this fact, you will be pursued and hated by the rebels who refuse him as king. So persevere to the end. Now, some people believe, believe that our salvation is in our perseverance. Others believe that our perseverance is supplied or guaranteed in our salvation. Wherever you land in that discussion, know this, that those who do endure to the end will be saved. So make it your priority to endure to the end, Jesus says. Number four, now you have the destruction of the temple. So flee to the hills. Let's read this, verses 20 through 24. It says, but when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then you know that its desolation has come near. Now Matthew adds the phrase, when you see the abomination that causes desolation, standing where it should not be in the temple place. He says, then let, the, let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains and let those who are inside the city depart and let not those who are out of the country enter it. For there are day, these are days of vengeance. Matthew's gospel says there will be tribulation at that time that has never been matched up until that time. So just horrible things. He says, alas, for women, who are pregnant. Oh, woe to women who are pregnant and for those who are nursing infants in those days. For there will be great distress or tribulation upon the earth and wrath against this people. They will fall by the edge of the sword and be led captive among the nations and Jerusalem will be trampled underfoot by the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. So let's unpack this. Jesus predicts this cataclysmic, this catastrophic event of Jerusalem's demise and this does happen in AD 70. Titus surrounded the armies or his army surrounded 
the armies of Jerusalem and the city in about AD 64. And they tried to starve them out. So what they did is they cut off any supplies into the city and they tried to starve these people out. Historian Josephus records that such a severe famine swept across the city at the time that most of the people who died in that war died from famine. In fact, when Josephus goes in to negotiate for Titus, what he records, what he saw is ghastly and grisly. He goes into the city and he sees pregnant women and he sees nursing mothers, this very thing that Jesus talked about, in the street. And he, what he says is, it looks as though wherever they sat, life just left them. And then he says he sees the elderly and the people who could not care for themselves, just the streets littered with bodies. And then he goes into the temple to negotiate. And when he goes into the temple, it is a grisly, gruesome scene. There has been cannibalism that has been going on inside of the temple complex because they were so starving so bad. He said the stench that filled their nostril was just like unimaginable. There were so many dead bodies. What we learn from historians like Josephus is this, that 1.1 million Jews died in this war. That was their Holocaust. 1.1 million. And as a matter of fact, they didn't have enough graves to bury the corpses. So you know what they did with them? They piled them up, gathered them into heaps, and threw them over the southern and western wall. You know where that is? The Valley of Hinnom. That word is Gehenna means the Valley of Hinnom. It's translated in your Bible, hell. And then they set the bodies on fire and the bodies that didn't rot were set aflame. And this beautiful city that was once gleamed in the Middle Eastern sunlight, gilded temples and whitewashed stones is now blood-soaked on fire, the stench of smoke. And Jesus sees it today. He sees it and he's trying to relay it to the disciples. This is where your city is going to end up. And so essentially what he's telling them is this. If or since the people have followed the path of revolution, the vision of a revolutionary Messiah, this is inexorably where it's going to lead them, to the destruction of their town and their city and their holy temple. But if you would follow me, if you would turn and repent and follow me, you could avert destruction and I would be the king of your heart. I would be the king of your mind and your life and my kingdom would be everlasting and it would be unassailable, unmovable. Christian historian Eusebius uh, recorded that most Christians heeded Jesus' words literally and so they fled to a city, uh, the high city called Pella. Most Christians made it out because they had this prophecy they knew it well. They knew it by heart. And so they fled to Pella or other Greek cities and they made it out. But many of the Jews did not. Now you can imagine the severity on Jesus' face and just like, what? Like the disciples look on their face. Like, what are you talking about? But then he encourages them. He says, the son of man comes in glory, so be watchful. The verses 25 through 28, he says, and there will be signs and in sun and moon and stars and on the earth, distress of nations and perplexity because of the roaring of the sea and the waves. People fainting with fear and with foreboding and what is coming on the world. The powers of the heavens will be shaken. And then they will see the coming of the Son of Man in a cloud with power and great glory. Now Matthew, in his version, he tells us this is the sign. You will see the sign of the coming of the Son of Man coming in glory and power. And he says, now when these things begin to take place, straighten up, raise your heads, because your redemption is drawing near. So he says, the Son of Man is coming in glory. It's going to get worse before it gets better. The Son of Man is going to come in glory. You will see it. So be watchful and be hopeful. Straighten up. Lift your heads. Look up into the heavens and welcome your Savior who will come unmistakably. Jesus' language is hard to describe just how dependent on the Old Testament Jesus' language is here. It is so dependent on passages. Let me show you. Joel 2, 30 and 31. God says, And I will show wonders in the heavens and on earth, blood and fire and columns of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon to blood before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. You know which passage this is in Joel 2? This is the blow the trumpet in Zion. Remember that song? We used to sing that in church. What were we singing? We were talking about Judgment. 
Blow the trumpet in Zion. Here comes a plague of locusts. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like we totally didn't read the context there. But what Joel is saying is that if you will repent and turn to your, your king, if you will receive him, you can avert this coming judgment. But if not, here's what it's going to look like to be on the wrong side of God's judgment. Not a good day for you. Not a good day. Isaiah 13, likewise, prophesying to Babylon, Isaiah says this, for the stars of the heavens and their constellations will not give their light. The sun and the, will be dark at its rising and the moon will not shed its light. I will punish the world for its evil and the wicked for their iniquity. This is prophetic language. This is the way prophets use poetry to explain. This is what it's like to be on the wrong side of God's judgment and if you are, it's not going to be a good day for you. Very bad. Now, we understand that when Jesus comes, he is describing Daniel chapter seven. I wanna read that to you as well. Daniel chapter seven, here's what Daniel saw. It's called the prophecy of the son of man. He says, as I looked, thrones were placed and the ancient of days took his seat. His clothing was white as snow and the hair on his head was pure, like pure wool. His throne was fiery flames. Its wheels were burning fire. And behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a son of man. And he came to the ancient of days, which is God the Father, and was presented before him. And to him, that is to the son of man, was given dominion, glory, and a kingdom that all people's nations, languages would serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away and his kingdom is one that shall not be destroyed." And Jesus says, you will see the sign of the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great glory. Now, this did not happen in AD 70. God came in judgment to the city. Now, Jesus is smashing or he is meshing the far future with their near future. And he's saying, at the end, here's what you'll see. You will see God coming in glory. So, let me ask you a question. What about this fourth sign here of the temple? Is the temple going to re be rebuilt? Because there's not one there now, is there? No, there isn't. So is it going to be rebuilt? I don't know that. Probably not. I would say no. My first answer to that would be no, because when Jesus comes into the temple, here's what he says. Destroy this temple, and I will rebuild it in three days. And they lose their minds because they think he's talking about the temple complex. He's not. He's talking about himself. Jesus is the temple. The temple is the place where heaven and earth meet. It's the nexus where heaven meets earth. And Jesus is that place in humanity where heaven comes to earth. The presence, the glory of God comes among men and Jesus is the new temple. And then Paul says in 1 Corinthians 3 and 1 Corinthians 6, you and I are the living temple. That imagery in the Old Testament has been fulfilled in Jesus. That's why we as Christians, we meet in a gymnasium, not a temple. Because we are the temple. Wherever you are, you're the temple the, because the temple is the place where God's manifest presence is. God's presence is everywhere. He's, omni he's omni omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent. Yes, I got the right one, eventually. <laughs> God is everywhere all the time. There's nowhere to be where he is not. But God's manifest presence is in the temple. And when you walk onto your job, the temple showed up. When you walk into your family family's Thanksgiving di dinner, the temple is there because the presence of God goes with you. You and I, collectively and individually, we are the temple of God. So I would say, no, there's not going to be a third temple. But what if there is? Cool. I would say, that, that's kind of neat. I mean, uh, that would be interesting. I'll be, I'm happy to be wrong. Let's put it that way. I'm happy to hold my idea loosely. The next sign I think that you and I are looking for is one that will be unmistakable. As the lightning flashes from the east is visible in the west, the Son of Man is going to come in the clouds with great glory and power and it will be unmistakable. This is why Jesus says, don't look for these false messiahs in your small group. Don't go to a church service and think the Messiah is gonna show up. He's gonna come back, he's gonna split the eastern sky and he's gonna come down in glory and stand on the Mount of Olives and declare himself the consummated Lord over creation. Amen? Amen. All right. So false messiahs will increase, but don't believe them. The world will seem like it's just coming apart. Morality is collapsing. Institutions failing, shot through with corruption. The world is rumbling and groaning beneath our feet, but don't be alarmed. Don't be terrified by that. 
Persecution against the family of God will be more pronounced. It will be more acute as that time draws near. But you, Jesus says, persevere to the end. Endure. And many will fall away due to harsh conditions. But you look up. You stiffen your spine and you, look your, you lift your chin to heaven because your salvation draws near. He's coming on the clouds. And this Lamb of God who came in meekness as the Lamb's sacrifice for the world will come roaring out of heaven as the Lion of Judah. Make no mistake about it. Let's pray. God, today we are anticipating that day. We have met this morning to proclaim this message to the world, to each other, that you're the Lamb of God who came in meekness, service, and humility to die for our sins, that you have risen from the dead victorious over sin and death, but that someday you are coming again and we proclaim this message until you come and you're going to roar out of heaven as the Lion of Judah and we're going to celebrate it, God. And if you're here this morning and if you have not received Jesus as your Savior, your King, don't wait. Don't wait till you walk out that door Don't wait till you leave this building. Make your decision right now. Jesus, you are my king. You are my slain lamb, the Messiah, my savior. And receive him now.